Um, sure. I think we're. I think what we're doing now is a is the exercise that I would encourage everybody to do. Everything is another one of those. So that if you looked at war, go back in time and look at the times that we had war. Look at the break. Look at Pearl Harbor. Harbor and what happened in terms of that. Look at the European wars. In other words, the worst ones. Um, and then say, how did they hap How did they occur in the past? in order to gain a perspective. Because what you're bringing to the table right now is the notion of the same things happening over and over again and the lessons from history. And that's the exercise. Everything is another one of those that happens over and over again. So just w whenever you're thinking about one of those, if you just go back and say when, what happened, it'll help uh, to give some sort of perspective. So I just want to paraphrase, if I could, for a second. Right? We're, we're, the lesson that Ray is giving us on this subject is study history, look at what's occurred, then try to figure out how it reflects today. And what I found, if I go back to 65, so I check out this book, I had to have it sent to me, called Long-Term Corporate Bond Experience. And I discover an unbelievable thing that Heckman, head of the Cleveland Reserve, had done. He had track the history of every single bond issued from 1900 to 1944 and what happened to it. So this data was available to everybody and what do you learn? You learn that everything that people are saying about credit is wrong. Everything. The worst credit is sovereign debt, yet everybody said it was best. And every country was rated AAA, even Venezuela. Second, you learn that the second weakest credit was individuals, they default, and then the best credit was small and medium companies and, and, and large companies, and that the spreads were too wide even during the Depression. Now, this fact was available to everybody, no computers, unbelievable job to have to keep track of everything for 44 years, then it's updated uh, from 44 into the 1960s by someone else. And I think one of the things you're seeing in Ray and his firm is this understanding, at least that you understand history and what occurred and I, how does it reflect the future. I think, uh, I think then you ask yourself, what is the most analogous period in history? And I would say 1937 is the most analogous period in history to where we are today. Um, just take a moment if you if you want to take a moment on that. Um, so analogous in the following sense. Um, in 1929 to 1932, uh, we had a debt crisis was, which was uh, similar to the debt crisis that we had in 2008, 2009. To, uh, then you get to hit zero interest rates. And so when you hit zero interest rates, the Federal Reserve can't any longer ease monetary policy by lowering interest rates. So it had to expand its balance sheet, in other words, essentially print money, and buy financial assets to, to put those financial assets up and put more liquidity in the system. So as a result, um, 1932 to 1937 was very similar to 2009 to the present period of time. And during that period of time, there was um, a, a big rise also in the wealth gap. Uh, right now, the top one-tenth of one percent of the population's net worth is equal to the bottom 90% combined. And if you look at that income gap, you would have to go back to 1935 to 1940. So we had a situation which was somewhat analogous. And then in 1937, as in now, the Federal Reserve began to tighten monetary policy. I'm not saying, by the way, the same thing is going to happen. I hope that there's a lesson to be no, no, learned by that. But there was asymmetric risk. And so what we have is... For some of the audience that doesn't remember vividly what happened to financial markets in the 37 period, why don't you just review it with it for a moment? Well, this, the stock market, <clears throat> stock market went down 50%. Um, and we had what, what was then the first time we call a recession which was like a re-depression, and that's, that's the, in a sense, that. And what had happened was, and we had the beginning of populism around the world. So that was, 
Populism that was not a term that we're used to using here. It's a relatively modern term, but it was a popular. It was a term that existed back over then, and because that meant we had strong leaders who were um, also nationalistic leaders, um, who were more confrontational by nature, and we also then had that wealth gap. So one could imagine that if we had a downturn now, well, we don't want a downturn, but if we were to have a downturn, I don't think we'll have one. But if we were to have a downturn, I think that that would cause a lot of social and political conflict. In other words, there's a wealth conflict, there's that kind of environment. So we had that kind of an environment, a co more a, an environment of greater conflict. So I think it's, an, it's interesting that it's analogous. I would say if you look at populism, um, when we started to see populism, populism, it's, I'm not just referring, I'm, I'm referring to the phenomenon, not just the people. Uh, the phenomenon grows in a certain way, and to study it, I, there's something I put on LinkedIn if people are interested. It's a case study of 14 different populism. What is populism? How does it grow? How does it behave? 14 cases, and then what is its archetypical? But if you're looking at it, it lies beneath the surface in Europe. It lies beneath the surface elsewhere, and it's one of those things that we have to be careful of. And so economically, I think, as we talk about the issues of our time, we have uh, the wealth and opportunity gap, which is a phenomenon that we uh, that is analogous, and we have to have some of those uh, pay some of those uh, pay attention to that. I'm only bringing this up because you were uh, referring to the same things happening over and over again, and then looking at a particular period. And I think that begs the question: Okay, so what is the analogous period to today? <laughs>